1991, Eric Clapton's four-year-old son fell from the 53rd floor of an apartment to his death. How can a parent ever respond to something like this? Eric Clapton, being a songwriter, responded in part by writing the song, Tears in Heaven. And the song includes a heartbreaking dialogue between himself and his son in heaven, as Eric Clapton imagines it. And he asks this question, would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? Would it be the same if I saw you in heaven? Would you know my name and would it be the same? When I get to heaven, will you recognize me? Will we share the same relationship, the same love that we shared here on earth? This is a question that the Sadducees, in a strange kind of way, were also asking. But for them, the question is a joke. First of all, who are these Sadducees? Uh, the only information historically we have on these Sadducees is written by others. We have nothing left in history that the Sadducees themselves actually wrote. So we have things by rabbis, Pharisees, early Christians, and Josephus, and they all think the Sadducees are wrongheaded. So we don't get any, we don't get the other side of the coin. So recognizing that, that our, our sources are a little bit flawed, how do we reconstruct things? Well, it seems what we can say about the Sadducees is in the second temple period, the second temple period, when the, the temple was still standing in Jerusalem, it seems that the Sadducees were the ones in control. They were the ones with the influence and the power. When the temple was destroyed in 70 CE, their fortune shifted over time. And again, over time, the power shifted to the Pharisees or the group that was the Pharisees at one point. And the rabbis were born sort of as a collection of all those people, but mostly the dominant voice was that of the Pharisees. So the Sadducees represent an older perspective that believed only the Torah to be the word of God. The Torah, as a reminder, is the first five books of the Bible. So only those which they believed were written by Moses, only those were inspired and authoritative. Now, the Pharisees, of course, also believed in the Torah, but they also believed in the Psalms, the prophets, and all the other writings. They also believed, the Pharisees, for what it's worth, in a, in a spirit-inspired oral tradition. But the Sadducees would have none of this. They rejected the prophets. They rejected the Psalms. They might have sung the Psalms, but they didn't see them as Holy Scripture. A little bit of background. So some of these people, some of these Sadducees come to Jesus and ask him a silly question, not because they're interested in learning, but because they want to make a fool of him in front of the people. They don't like Jesus, and they're trying to discredit him. In Deuteronomy 25, it is the responsibility of a brother to take his brother's wife if he dies or the brother dies having no son. This, might, this law might sound troubling or weird or odd to us, but originally it was probably intended as a way of some sort of support for widows who were vulnerable, more vulnerable then, uh, as well as giving an offspring to a dead, a dead man, which was also as, considered very important. In any event, the Sadducees don't really care about this fictional woman, and they don't really care about the seven dead husbands. They only set up this ridiculous question to make Jesus sound ridiculous, to make the whole idea of life after death to sound ridiculous. Yet Jesus takes their ridiculous question seriously. What's the problem? Well, Jesus says, the problem says for all your commitment to Holy Scripture, you have impoverished imaginations. And sometimes I suspect that we too have impoverished imaginations. And it's not really a surprise. Regardless of how old or how young you are, all you know is what you've experienced or picked up along the way in this world. 
So everything you know is conditioned and brought about in the context of this world. And so when we hear talk about God's imagination for a future world, something different in the future, it's not surprising that when we try to put it together in our imaginations, all the building blocks come from what we know. So this world begins to look a lot like basically just a continuation. Heaven, life after death is more or less a continuation of life before death. I've, I've heard people say, to illustrate this, that eternal life is not a desirable thing because it would just get tedious and boring, going on and on, doing the same thing over and over. But that's really only true if eternal life is basically this life lasting forever. Because this life, as wonderful as it is, 2,000 years into it, would, might get a little bit tedious. But the future life that God imagines and that Jesus seems to imagine along with God is quite different. So Jesus, as an illustration, talks about Abraham. Now, it's interesting to note, Abraham is still Abraham. There is a connection between who we are and who we will be in heaven. We still are who we are. We will be the same and yet different. The same and yet different. Abraham will still be Abraham is still Abraham, and you will still be you. And yet, we will be different. Jesus says we will be like angels. He does not say we will become angels. He's only using angels as a point of comparison. What's the point of comparison that he's wanting to make? Well, they do not die, and they do not marry. So we'll be like angels in as much as we will not die, and we will not marry anymore. So our destiny, our, uh, as Jesus imagines it, is to transcend gender. So in the final analysis, if you take the long picture, gender is fluid. What we are now is not what we're going to be. And this is uh, good news for people who are trans, who have been trying to tell us that gender is not always black and white, simple, simple things. But I digress. You will still be you, and you will be different. Jesus is basically telling the Sadducees that the premise of their question is deeply flawed. And he says, God is the God of Abraham. He is the God of Isaac and Jacob. And the key here in Jesus's argument is the present tense to be word is, is, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If the Sadducees were right, what this statement from Torah means is that God remembers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, probably fondly, but he's not really, you can't really consider him their God because they don't exist anymore. So the idea is to say that they are the God presumes that Something's going on in the present tense. Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob died and yet lived to God and God to them. And extending Jesus' words, I, I think we can think that nobody has ever died or nobody has ever lived without living and dying to God. So today we celebrate All Saints Day, a day in which we remember all the saints who have died, known or unknown. Last Wednesday was All Souls Day, in which we remember all those who died in faith. I also add an out of faith. God is the great lover of all souls to whom nothing is finally lost. So I believe All Souls is a day for all souls, not just those who are Christian. So would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? Would it be the same if I saw you in heaven? Will Clapton's son know him? So I use my imagination. That's all I have when we're talking about these sorts of things. Eric's standing before his son and says, do you know my, do you know my name? And I imagine his son answering yes. 
Abraham, after all, is still Abraham, and you will still be you. Then Eric asks, will it be the same? Will we have the same relationship? And I imagine his son responding to this, no. Will it be the same? No, nothing's going to be the same. What we were and what we are and what we will be, not the same. It's going to be so different that all our attempts to imagine it are going to sound are going to begin to sound a little bit foolish, as foolish as the Sadducees question, I think. All of our attempts are going to end up sounding a little bit bizarre, perhaps. Or to put it in the words of Paul the Apostle, quoting Isaiah, what no eye has seen, nor, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, this is what God has prepared for those who love him. No heart has even conceived it. So we'll, we'll end today's service with the doxology, one of my favorite parts of the service, which says, glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. And I love that because what it tells us is when it comes right down to it, God has a much bigger and better imagination than we do. And praise be to God for that. Amen.